With this video, we start a new collection of topics related to sampling. We're going to look at some kind of more advanced things and also some kind of more practical considerations that one has to consider when sampling real world signals. That's what I mean by um, other practical considerations up here. And then we'll also get into some applications of sampling, things called like pulse modulation, pulse code modulation, and just digital signaling topics in general. So this is our outline for this set of charts. In this first section, we're going to look at what I called other practical considerations. Basically, we're going to examine the fact that in the real world, all the signals that we look at are time limited. So that's going to introduce some interesting things compared to kind of the cartoon transform frequency domain representations we've been drawing. And then also we'll look at the impact of sampling with something other than impulses. All the math that we've done so far has assumed that we have this ideal impulse train available to sample with which in reality we really can't generate. So what are some of the practical considerations we need to take into account when doing sampling in the real world? And then we'll get to the rest of these topics in the subsequent videos. All right, so let's talk about time-limited signals. Anything we deal with in the real world is going to be time-limited because that signal started at some point, for instance, when we turn on a signal generator, and typically it'll stop at some point too when we either turn the signal generator off or when we stop digitizing slash recording the signal. So just about anything we do in the real world is going to deal with something that's time limited, a signal that has a start time and a stop time. That's very important because there's a very important fact about time limited signals, and that is that if you are time limited, you cannot be bandwidth limited. That means all of the spectrums that we've been sketching that look like triangles or rectangles for which you can go identify very easily a maximum frequency you won't be able to do that for a time limited signal because when you plot their spectrum, they will have signal content that doesn't stop. It actually goes on for forever. So identifying the max frequency in that case is very tough. These equations right here quantify this time limited band limited phenomenon. So TD right here stands for time duration. And this is a metric that you can compute for a continuous time signal X of T. So here's X of T. If I plug any continuous time signal into this equation right here and do the computation, you can see what happens on the denominator. Basically, I'm computing the energy of that signal. And then on the numerator, it's very similar, except I'm multiplying by t squared. So what this tends to do is I tend to have values for td that are large for signals x of t that exist for a long amount of time on the time axis. For instance, a signal that exists from time of minus 1,000 to 1,000 as I'm multiplying 1,000 squared at time 1,000 times this, that results in a TD that's very large. On the other hand, if my signal only exists from time minus 0.1 to 0.1, then when I multiply by T at those periods of time and do the weighting here in the numerator, I end up with a TD that's very small. So if you kind of look at these numerator and denominator terms and think about what happens as I have signals that exist for long periods of time or short periods of time, you can kind of see how TD grows and shrinks accordingly. BW is the bandwidth of a signal, and it's defined very similarly, except all of these quantities in the definition of BW are with respect to frequency. But you can make the exact same arguments. If I have a continuous time signal X of T, whose Fourier transform is X of omega, if X of omega exists for a very large amount of frequencies omega, then this integral here on the numerator will be very large, resulting in a BW scalar that is very large. On the other hand, if I have a signal that exists in the frequency domain for only a small amount of omega, maybe from minus one radian a second to one radian a second, then the omega squared weighting here, when multiplying, it ends up with an integral that's very small, and I end up with a BW that is very small. So again, bandwidth, in terms of how it's defined here, give us a measure for how much frequency content or how much bandwidth the signal has. So we have a metric for what we call the time duration, how spread out on the time axis something is. We have a definition for bandwidth, how spread out on the frequency axis something is. And the interesting thing is that their product is always greater than or equal to one half. And that's where how we relate time and bandwidth to each other here. Since their product is always greater than one half, that means if I have a very small time duration, I have to have a very large bandwidth. Or vice versa, if I have a very small bandwidth, then I must have a very large time duration. So as we shrink one of these, the other has to grow. 
and we must always have their product greater than one half. This is sometimes called the uncertainty principle. It's uh, as you shrink one dimension, you grow the other dimension. We see this in physics called the uncertainty principle in physics. As I more precisely locate something in position, I know less and less about its velocity and vice versa. So it's very similar to that phenomena that you've seen in physics. For us though, for sampling, what this means is since I'm always going to be dealing with a signal that is time limited, that means its bandwidth is always going to be very, very large. And I'm not going to be e able to pick off a max frequency because the bandwidth is technically gonna go off. Um, it's gonna be finite bandwidth, but I'm not gonna be able to find that maximum frequency number. It's just gonna keep going for forever. So what we'll do to get a little uh, more intuition to these, I kind of argued through them verbally on how TD grows and shrinks as the signal is stretched on the time axis and similarly how bandwidth shrinks and grows as the signal changes in the frequency domain. In the next video, we'll actually um, explore these just a little bit with a MATLAB script. I'll code up a continuous time signal X of T. We'll look at its Fourier transform X of omega and we'll see how this always is satisfied for the one particular example we're looking at.